Um, I've written them down so I don't confuse every <laughs> everyone's dates and campaigns. So we'll start a little bit about Hans. So Hans worked in hospitality for about 28 years, um, owning her own business and actually going through, which is probably one of my favourite stories about Hans, is that she was a licensed private investigator. <laughs> so Hans um, lives in Melbourne and, and joined the onshore crew over in Victoria as a um, volunteer and then moved on to being education coordinator for Victoria and then started on her campaign journey with Sea Shepherd and she's been with us for about 11 years um, doing various roles um, she's got here. <laughs> Um, her first Antarctic campaign was on the Steve Irwin as a quartermaster on Operation Relentless in 2013. She then moved on to uh, their ship's donation role and moved up the ranks as an officer and has sailed on all four of our large vessels. Eventually, she's been, she became the chief officer on the MV Ocean uh, Warrior and the MV uh, Steve Irwin. Getting confused here. <laughs> Um, her biggest challenge was ship's manager on the Steve, which is actually how I met Hans when she came through to Adelaide on the Steve Irwin in 2018. Um, and she's completed 10 campaigns with us sailing all over the world. So she's got a few things under her belt there. <laughs> um, Chad is our ship's, or he was a ship's communication officer, but he also works for our IT department. So Chad and I are very familiar. I'm always calling him when I have problems with the iPad on stalls. So he knows my face and my, <laughs> my voice very well. Um, after moving to Melbourne, he, he lived near our base over in Melbourne where we docked the Steve Irwin and any ships between campaigns and just decided since he's sort of grown up with nature, closely with nature, um, it was just sort of a, a logical step to join up as an onshore volunteer and then head over and be a um, crew member on the Steve Irwin for uh, Operation Reef Defence. Um, he then moved on in 2019 and joined Operation Gambian Coastal Defence on the Bab Bob Barker as Communication Officer and Quartermaster. Um, we've also got Adam here, who is a captain. Just turn my notes over. Um, he has worked with Sea Shepherd since 2011 as Chief Officer and Captain of the Bridget Bardot, Sam Simon, Bob Barker and Ocean Warrior. He's participated in many campaigns over the world, including Antarctic campaigns and the ones in the Faroe Islands. Personal record for his time at sea is 147 days on board the Bob Barker for um, our, I'm sure a lot of people here have seen it, the Catching the Thunder film where we chased um, the thunder for 110 days up to Africa. And I think Hans, Simon and Adam were all on that campaign. So I'm sure they've got some stories to tell today. And then finally, we've got Chief Mate Simon Ager. He's a native of Alberta and is currently in North Vancouver in Canada, like we said. Um, he is a very, very accomplished guy. He has a career spanning 18 years as a TV graphic artist. He created the opening titles for the BBC's Wildlife on One and is an award-winning visual effects artist for the film and television. He has worked on Stargate, Angels and Demons, iRobot and Tropic Thunder. Um, in the last 12 years, he's been with Sea Shepherd on 27 campaigns um, as an officer, a ship's manager and primarily as a diver and stills photographer with images appearing in the New York Times, National Geographic New Zealand, La Pointe magazine and all across the Billabong stores as well. So if you've seen a photo on a Sea Shepherd campaign, it's most likely that Simon took that photo. So I'd like to welcome these four to the panel. Sean, can I just add that some yeah. of the footage that was in Sea Spiracy, Simon took as well? Yes. Amazing. Amazing uh, credits for all of you guys. But I'm probably just going to hand over straight to Hans. And um, if anyone has any questions, I'll come around with Mike, pop your hand up, and, um, yeah, we'll get going. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure where to start. But <laughs> I guess I'll just talk about the movie a little bit, um, Sea Spiracy. Um, I remember when my mum went to go see it, she came out of the movie and, and um, she was in tears and she just said, oh, you know, what can I do to make changes? And and I said, I said, mum, I've been telling you this stuff <laughs> for like the last six years that I've been on the ships. Like this is all the stuff, the stuff that Sea Spiracy has put in the movie is the stuff that we've seen when we've been out at sea. And, and um, I've been, and I said to her, I've been trying to tell you this, what's going on out there 
because this is the stuff I've seen from my own eyes. And she said, yeah, but it's different when you see it in a movie, when you hear from one of us coming off the ships with all our stories and then you see it visually in a movie, it's, it, it gives a different impact. So as, even though my mum has heard so many things that I used to tell her, even she couldn't visually see the, the devastation that's going on in the oceans with the rubbish and the human trafficking and all those stories that I used to come home and tell her. Um, the movie has actually, for us, brought all of that to light and, and out to the public that um, I think now it's a bit more understandable sort of what we go through when we go out there and the things that we see, um, even though it's one thing to hear us tell you the stories, but to visually see it yourself, it just things it brings up to another level, I think. I don't know, what do you guys think? Adam? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think it's interesting how that finally this movie brings up the idea of, of fishing altogether, you know, whereas in a lot of the other things, nobody wants to talk about the legal fishing and how destructive even the legal regulated fishing is. And I think that's one of the things I, that uh, I really liked about the movie is it, it brought that right to the forefront of how even the regulated dolphin safe, all the rest of it is a bunch of baloney. And, you know, eating fish is just a, the biggest destructive thing you can do for the ocean. Yeah, and I think also, um, I, I don't remember this being in part of the movie, is also the, the fish that's fed to uh, domestic animals as well. So, you know, that's the destruction of that. And also, you know, with the farm fish, they've got to get the, the wild fish to make the pellets to feed the farm fish. So it's all a vicious cycle and none of it is sustainable, as everyone tends to think. And I think the, the massive thing that really impacted me when I was on the first trip on the Ocean Warrior in Tanzania with you guys um, was when we rescued those people who, who um, the 61 people that we picked up that were floating out at sea, you know, coming from Kenya into, into Tanzania. Right. And, uh, yeah, you remember that? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that was the, the thing about the movie is that it, it just brought up all the parts of uh, what's going on with, and it all goes back to commercial fishing. And, you know, I grew up on the coast and my brother was a fisherman, my stepfather was a fisherman. And the, the changes that have happened in that industry in my lifetime are astonishing. And, you know, the idea, like he says, of this couple of guys in a small boat going out and catching fish is, is just not the reality anymore. I mean, you know, the boats we saw, the big uh, purse saners aren't anything, there, there's no mom and pop thing about that. It's just a massive, expensive ship just cleaning up the oceans and i think that if if we saw that as a way to you know to, instead of have, eating chickens we went out to the park and there was just huge nets thrown over all the birds and they were dragged in mm -hmm. and you know that's how we got our birds people wouldn't eat birds either you know yeah. and, and it's the same with fishing it's because it's out of sight most people aren't offshore they don't see it they don't see how destructive and horrible it is and so it continues on mm -hmm. And um, Simon, I think you were doing, you're outside of Sea Shepherd, you're, you're on a boat at the moment. Where are you right now? I'm just off the uh, coast of Vancouver Island right now. I work on a, an eco tourist vessel. Uh, uh, so when I'm not with Sea Shepherd, I'm here doing um, tours up in the Great Bear Rainforest uh, in the Broughtons, looking at. Uh, the famed spirit bears, the uh, humpbacks, and just the wildlife really trying to uh, inspire the guests to care about what we have here and around the world. And I'll even put on a little slideshow of my Sea Shepherd life just to uh, kind of enforce a little more of exactly what's going on around the world and even here back at home, because obviously we've got all the fish farms that are a huge problem here. So I always try and highlight that on the on the tours that we do and i think again, i remember you sending me a message a while ago that you had pulled in some lines you pulled in like a whole lot of lines left over from fishing vessels um how much was that again that you pulled in uh well that was a campaign actually off the coast here because of covid our uh the tourism industry took a huge hit so uh, the government funded for two years of uh, 10 million dollars a year for uh, three or four companies, which, which was uh, nine vessels to go out off the west coast of Vancouver Island and start doing a massive cleanup of plastics, fishing gear, uh, anything that you could find. And uh, 
we've actually in the twos we came up with about 330 tons right now which is a, a small drop in the ocean because considering this i believe uh cbc our news channel here reported about uh something like 8,000 tons a day or 8 million tons, something as ridiculous goes into the ocean every day globally. So we're really just trying to highlight the damage that's being done. And we're finding a lot of stuff from uh, Fukushima that's uh, been sitting there for you know years upon years and a lot of stuff from Washington state. And uh, I mean, we cleaned up a lot of beaches so there was nothing left. And then we went back there maybe three weeks later and then there was, it was stuff on the beach, you know, so it's rolling in as fast as you clear it up. You know? So I think it's a, a campaign that's going to be ongoing. I expect we'll end up doing it uh, early next year as well, just to try and carry on and uh, keep people busy and keep keep it in the news. That, you know, the, the amount of damage that's being done out there with marine debris. Mm. And um, Chad, uh, you, when, you, when you're on the Bob Barker last vessel that you were on where were you at what was that uh, i was in the i was off the coast of the gambia um yeah it was it was pretty interesting uh never had really been in a situation where uh you know we're pulling over vessels left and right um and we would work with the local governments there and when we one of the questions that we kept asking was we pull these ships over and they're always doing something wrong um, and the Gambian government was kind of like, we're only going to pull them up on the really big stuff because they're just going to tie them up in court forever and ever and ever on the small stuff. So they really only wanted to focus on the really big stuff. Um, but the amazing thing on these ships is that sometimes they're really big and they're, that they're clean and they're new um, and they're doing everything right. But then we find 54 shark fins on the, the monkey deck, you know, just the craziest thing you'd ever think of. Um, and the captain just said, hey, go up on the monkey deck, take some pictures of your ship. And that's where, how we found it. We didn't even think to go up there. Um, you know, and then some of the vessels you get on and they're so filthy. You know, it's, it's amazing that we, as humans are, you know, we go into kitchens and we have all these rules and regulations about how clean, clean they are. But you go on these ships and the, the toilet is a hole on the side of the ship and the fish are being dropped into that and then being flash frozen right after. Um, did I just swear? I'm sorry. Um, but it's it's amazing to see the difference in the ships and and how they're just they're just pulling up everything. They're they're not interested in anything. Like they're definitely interested in per certain fish, but they're just pulling up everything and throwing whatever they can back, but not quickly, like very slowly. Um, it was very disheartening to see this, and all, not all that, but the living conditions of the people on the crew. I remember when we were. Um when we were on the Bob Barker for the ice fish campaign and we were chasing the thunder and I don't remember um Adam they were they had the burn barrel off the back of the ship remember and they yeah. were burning all the all the the boys off the back and the the and, and all that plastic I remember at night time it, it actually looked really beautiful because of that red light fire <laughs> coming off the back of the ship but um all that plastic was just dripping into the ocean just dripping yeah. you can only imagine it just like this big huge chunk of melted plastic and as soon as it hits the cold ocean it just turns into a solid ball and and all that's in there it's just a, probably a line of drips of plastic all the way that we were chasing for miles and miles um you know so yeah, there's no not doubt. there's not yeah there's not just the the fishing line there's that as well that they're putting in it's like to try and get away from us which you know didn't work but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's these things, the aspects of these campaigns that you don't realize actually goes on. Like, like I said, I didn't know anything about human trafficking until we were on the Ocean Warrior and then, and uh, the plastics that they, you know, it's, it's just the, the things I've learned over the last six years. And then when Seaspiracy came out, it was it just reiterated all of that, you know? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, it, it's the industry is just full of, of bad things. It's not like there's any good good that comes out of it you know the, the fishing's destructive the uh human trafficking is horrible the pollution i mean we were in cabo verde cleaning the, the beach there um you know that it's just covered in nets and they come from all over europe and for some reason they wash up on that one beach and it's a big turtle nesting beach and so we had to go there and clean the clean the beach and they do it every year but then the turtles still are getting caught up in these nets 
So it's like, and some of those nets had never even been fished. They were still banded together and had fallen off the deck somewhere, but because of the currents, they wash up there. And there's no tracing where those nets come from. You know, if they had some sort of tagging or, you know, IDs on them that you could say, hey, this net came from this boat and you could follow up somehow, you know, to make people clean up after themselves, but there's not, it's just another net in the ocean. And they're, you know, they're floating everywhere. I found when we were, um, I think it was on the Sam Simon in Antarctica and in the middle of the pristine, you know, we're south of 60, there's nothing around. And we found a big net floating around in there that we pulled out. And even when you pull them out, you know, there's all this stuff entangled in them and killing seabirds too with long liners. They've been trying for years, but that's one of the reasons that the albatross are going extinct is because they dive for the bait as it comes in and they get tangled in the line and they drown. And, uh, you know, they're, they're on the verge of extinction because of it. it's so many things that are wrong in that uh, industrial fishing. And, you know, it's not no other industry do we get our meat or our food from where we go out in the wild and take it. I mean, we wouldn't, you wouldn't think to go out and, you know, hunt for all the meat that people eat in the, in the country. You wouldn't think to go out and forage for all the fruits and vegetables it just doesn't make any sense and yet we do it still in this fishing and it's and it's okay again because it's out of everybody's sight you know they don't see any of this go on they see the, the fish in the supermarket and they buy and eat it and there's all these lies that are told about how healthy it is and how it was lying caught and everything else it's it's all a bunch of uh, whitewash you know it's mm -hmm. it's absolute baloney and the the uh, industry is just an unsustainable industry it has to it has to stop that's all what do you what do you say to people when they say um oh, fish don't feel pain and all that sort of you know all that stuff you know well why wouldn't they feel pain right yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's just a switch that oh it's a fish it doesn't feel pain it doesn't make yeah. any sense at all it's i mean you can see them when they're in a trapped in a net they have a yeah. look of panic on their face and there's you know people call it anthropomorphism but it's just you recognizing in another creature that it's in distress and you can see them when they are flopping around the deck. They're they're reacting to stimulus, right? It's pain. It's pain. They want to be back in the water. They, of course, they feel pain. That's the most insane thing to think that something doesn't feel pain. It has a brain. It has a spinal cord. It has nerves. It has a far, you know, more uh, feeling than we do. It can feel temperature in the water. It can feel electric vibrations. Mm -hmm. It's it's crazy talk. It's another, uh, you know, just whitewash of the industry to try and say, oh, a fish doesn't feel pain. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sean, does anyone have any questions or anything? Hello, there we go. Um, I have a couple to start with. Um, I think um, Sea Spiracy, I mean, hands up who has seen Sea Spiracy. I think most people have definitely. Um, I think that it was really impactful. Talking from an Adelaide perspective as well, we had a lot of volunteers um, join our onshore crew and come through because they were so affected by the movie. So um, I think what was the most important take from the movie for each of you guys, I reckon? um f for us yes yeah for you oh i think i think for me the most important thing well all of it is important i think the whole movie is um really highlighted a lot of stuff that we've been sea chef has been trying to say for years but i think the, the thing that really highlighted the most for me was the human trafficking um and the the reality of that because people just sort of think it's like it's like the seal clubbing say the seal clubbing they do in canada people still say to me to this day oh do they still do that Yes, they still do that. It's just human trafficking is a real thing. You know, it does get done. And this now is bringing it out to the forefront. And then, you know, so that was for me a, a big highlight, a big um, reality check. So I don't know about you guys. What do you guys think? Uh, do you want to go with Adam or me? You go ahead, Simon. Okay. Um, I think probably the biggest thing is, again, just bringing home a consumer education. As Adam uh, touched on earlier, there's a, a real disconnect and a, a real whitewashing of what the fishing industry is all about and these uh, the things that they do and the, the boards that they've created to try and fake that everything is, is all above board and uh, everything is caught in a, a healthy, clean way that doesn't affect anything else. So I think that movie is a real education as to what's really going on. So I hope it's that the average Joe will watch Seaspiracy and take a little more time at the supermarket and uh, decide uh, with a bit more of a moral conscience what they buy. 
after seeing that film, you know, and uh, yeah, it just take a little longer after watching it, you know, it, I think it, it touches on so many aspects, but for me, I think it would be the education as to, the, you know, dolphin friendly tuna, that kind of thing. I mean, I've been in the water in Gabon and seen all the, uh, the bycatch that goes on with the sharks, the manta rays, the, the whale sharks, everything getting caught up in these nets for a uh, yellow fin and blue fin tuna, you know, it's, uh, they don't tell you that on the tin. So hopefully that movie brings about that education. Adam? Well, I, I think one of the exciting things in the in the movie, and I hope to see more of it coming out, was all the vegan alternatives to seafood. Because mm -hmm. I grew up eating seafood, and it's probably was the hardest thing for me to give up uh, becoming vegan was to give up that taste. And it's, you know, it, it doesn't taste like anything else. And some of these new products are pretty amazing. Um, I make a lot of the fish burgers out of the Gardein fish. Yeah. And um, I'm really looking forward to more and more of that coming up in the episode at the end where they had the woman with her vegan, all the vegan uh, fish uh, products, you know, seafood products uh, was was super exciting to me. And, um, you know, I think it, it was a great thing that they said also about how the omega threes are from the algae. You don't eat mm -hmm. the fish. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, a bunch of vegans, but um it's obvious, right? You see, you see uh, old vegans who <laughs> are perfectly healthy without eating fish and animal products and all the rest of it. And I think that's the, the thing that hopefully we'll get across to people is that you don't need to eat the fish. You know, they can promote all these uh, health benefits and, uh, you know, really if you eat a good plant-based diet, you're going to be as healthy as anybody doing the rest of it. And you're going to be, it's going to be a lot better for the environment. Yeah. And on yeah. the same thing where the, now they're selling krill pills. So they're going to go take the food away from the whales in Antarctica to feed the people that don't need that supplement at all. Cause there's plenty of other ways to get those same oils. Um, but it's just depressing that they created an entire industry there. That's not needed for anything except for, uh, you know, people to make money off of to go down to Antarctica and, and take krill and then sell it to you at a pill. It's just, it's again, it's just crazy. But uh, so I was uh, that was exciting to me is that they, you know, presented some some choices of uh, people that still want to eat seafood, but it's not mm. seafood. Mm. Chad? Yeah, uh, to be honest, I was actually really staggered by some of the numbers. I know I hear him left and right, um, but, you know, some of the numbers were like just crazy, crazy, like four point six million fishing vessels are out there and. Three thirty, like three hundred thousand whales and dolphins are caught by bycatch every year. Like these numbers are staggering, um, and even down to like the a lot of the sharks that are out there now are anywhere between seventy and ninety percent lower than they were in the seventies. Their numbers, um, and the the visual thing that really caught me was the fish the 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 fish farms. Um, I for some reason I just never thought that would have I never really saw it, like envisioned a fish farm in my head. But when they were starting to do that montage of all the fish farms, I was just shocked. Um, not only that, but the fish, the way that they live is just awful. The conditions and the diseases they get um, is very disheartening. Mm -hmm. um, we've got Sean? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we've got a couple of questions here from Caroline, who's our National Education Coordinator for Sea Shepherd Australia. Hi, guys. Good to see you again. Um, one question I've got is around Hello. recently on Operation Albacore, one of the vessels pulled over was the renovation to a shrimp trawler and the actual rate of bycatch on that vessel was 99.8%. So 0.2% of the catch was actually shrimp. And on that same campaign, <coughs> there was another vessel caught intentionally trapping two humpback whales to lure in. What kind of bycatch rates and issues like that did you guys see on campaigns in Africa? I remember when they remember, well, actually the most, the bycatch that I saw the most of was on the ice fish campaign on the Sam Simon when they were pulling in those for the Patagonian toothfish and the um the uh, all the crabs and the and the other uh, you know and the crabs that have egg sacs on them so you're not just taking out that generation taking out the next generation of crab as well so there's the the and all the other kinds of fish that are caught on those nets and i also remember on ice fish too when we were pulling the nets from the chinese vessels and two seals got caught 
the seals that were playing in the nets, getting eating the fish, they got caught in the nets and we had to pull those seals in and that massive swordfish. It's just huge, the amount of catch I, I've seen. I don't know, you guys, what about you guys? I don't remember yeah, seeing this. Go ahead, Adam. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't know why they call it bycatch because they catch more of that than they catch of their target species always. You know, it's a, it's an order of magnitude bigger on things they catch that they don't want that they throw back. Um, one of the things my stepfather used to do as an educational thing is he would run a beach sand and pull it in and then let all the fish go to kind of show the kids. This was back in the 80s. But uh, the show everybody what was living so close to shore, and it's just like any other net. You catch everything. There's no, nothing gets out of there, you know? So mm -hmm. your target species is going to be one small percentage of that. And because it's a targeted species, there's going to be less of it. So there's all these other things that nobody wants, but they're in your net. And by the way, once you brought them up to the boat, they're not going to live. You know, very few of them will survive being brought up onto a ship, dumped back over the side in the time that it takes to get it all done. And so really it's, you know, this massive killing for one small piece of fish and all the rest of this goes into, you know, fish oil or fish mm -hmm. meal or all these other things. Um, so I, I don't know why they even call it bycatch because it's, it's really the main thing that they catch on those, on those ships. Mm -hmm. mm. Chad, you were going to. Yeah. Uh, I, I found that in the Gambia, they, okay, Chad. they would kind of drop nets and on the deck and then they would kind of organize uh, all the fish. And then I felt like off of the rest of it, they were just sweeping right back into the ocean. It was 10 minutes of, of dividing and then sweeping. Uh, but, you know, you, you could tell they were just sweeping dead fish at that point. It was, you know, and they, they, they just float in the, the ocean. It was pretty awful. Simon? Well, from, from my own experience, uh... I was on the first Albacore campaign, which was uh, an agreement signed with the Gabonese government. So that involved having uh, their military aboard the Bob Barker. And we were actually out uh, boarding the EU tuna fleet, which is 28 legal vessels that all have permits to fish in Gabonese waters. And uh, unfortunately, we, we had the one ship there. So you're trying to keep eyes on 28 vessels, but every vessel that I went to every morning when they sang around a school of tuna, rides whales, whale sharks, turtles, manta rays, uh, countless sharks. And as Adam said, if anything is pulled alongside for the most part, one survives. There are rules with showing diagrams on these vessels, how to put these uh, so-called bycatch animals back in the water, but none of that is followed. Just the regulations just throw things straight over the side because time is money. I've watched 128 sharks strung up by their tails one day, their stomachs falling out of their mouths and just thrown over the side. So they won't survive. The only uh, whales that did survive were the bride's whales, which uh, involved having sea shepherd crews swimming out to the seine or net, sitting on it to weigh it down. So the whale eventually could figure out that it could get over the top. And uh, the whale sharks, because they don't want to lose the catch, which is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, they pull it right alongside until they know the tuna can't escape. And so you've got a whale shark squashed up against the hull of the ship and the net, and then they roll it out. So it's getting scarred, cut up by the, the, the nets. So I saw that every day and I was out there for a month. You know? So that's just one vessel at one time. So out of 28 ships, I witnessed a vessel or two vessels every day doing that. So you find that amount of bycatch every day. And that's legal, that's legal vessels. You know, this isn't illegal fishing. This is all legal. And it's the fact that we had fisheries officers from Gabon on the boat that I think enforced the rules a lot more. I don't know if it, those guys were there, if, uh, if they would have put on the so-called African turtles back in the water correctly or something. You know? So it, the whole thing's pretty heinous. I mean, I went diving under these nets as Adam said as well, everything starts to panic. Just have to make sure they do. I mean, I was uh, on board and you can see the panic in their eyes. You can, I mean, there is character in those faces. So the, the whole thing, it's, it's, it, it's an abomination. So anytime they do say that tuna is friendly or it's all to the other species, that's 
Um, and we're losing you a little bit. Um, I think we can all agree from the Sea Shepherd campaigns in Africa, we know that the global UN data says that the bycatch rate is about 26%, but having seen what's coming out of the vessels in Africa, it's much higher than that, that a lot is being dumped overboard and dying. I think the rate is that of the sharks put back alive in the ocean, 90% actually die. They're just not going to survive that whole process, as you said, of being <coughs> trapped in the nets. My other question to you guys is we know that with what you've been seeing in Africa, the vessels will do a lot to hide what they're doing illegally, um, fake documents, uh, putting out the, the fake identification details so they can't be tracked, which is what's happening with the squid vessels, hiding their logbooks or doing duplicate logbooks. But we know the, the thunder itself went to extreme levels to actually hide what they were doing. I know that Simon was one of those crew that boarded the ship as it was sinking. Are you guys able to explain a bit more of what you saw and how far they went to ev evade actually being going into port and arrested? <laughs> you go, Simon. <laughs> well, I spent a lot of the time on the bridge with Adam because uh, he was the, the skipper at that time. But uh, it was an interesting period when uh, I got woken up at 6.30 in the morning to be told that the ship had been scuttled and everybody was jumping life rafts over the side. Um, and then to wait a few hours until the officers left the ship and uh, for myself and two other guys to jump on board a sinking vessel and run around it. Uh, you could clearly see that they tied every single door open to allow uh, the ingress of water. If your ship is hit something which they claim they'd hit a cargo container which causes ingress so you're not going to tie your doors open you're going to try and latch everything down to stop your ship from sinking but running around that vessel in the time that we had everything was tied open to allow the quickest ingress of water uh, uh, and it was a planned operation to sink that vessel when the officers did towards the sam simon they all came almost to cases that were pre-packed the night before or were an anal group, so they were thinking um, yeah but just stupid they didn't uh, throw their laptops and charts over the side so we, we were able to recover all the evidence of the uh, illegal fishing that's been going on around the world for, for years with these guys um, an amazing vessel is too bad it sunk <laughs> yeah um, just to go back to Sea Spiracy a little bit as well, um, I think from what I've been hearing on stalls and from people, one of the most confronting footages of the whole film is what it ends on with the Faroe Islands footage. Um, I know, Adam, you've spent some time in the Faroe Islands on campaign. Can you shed any light on how important it is to try and get this um, sort of terrible thing stopped? Yeah, well, the, the Faroe Islands is an interesting, interesting issue because... As they say in the in the uh, the film, it's it's not such an ecological disaster. It's much more of an animal rights issue there. I feel um, in that you know the the pilot whales are obviously social. They're you know in family groups and they slaughter the entire pod. You know, and it's it's just pretty heart wrenching. And it's not just the pilot whales; it's white sided dolphins and all sorts of other things that they drive in there. And it's also one of those interesting things because it is an indigenous uh, society. You know, the people that are there have been doing it for thousands of years. And uh, those sorts of hunts go on in the United States, uh, you know, in Alaska with the, with the First Nations people there. And so it's, it's a weird deal. And, the, you know, the problem there, of course, is that their technology is not anything like what it was when they were doing this thousands of years ago. Um, and that the need for the meat isn't there like it was thousands of years ago. So, you know, to me, that's really one of those campaigns that crosses over into the animal rights area, which I think there's two distinct parts to the, uh, to the veganism and to um, e ecology. You know, one is to try and create a sustainable world and, and take care of the ecology as it exists. And one is about, you know, what rights do animals have? And I think, uh, you know, with pharaohs, my feeling is that the, the pilot whales have the right to be left alone and to continue through that area. And um, it's one of those things I'm, I'm glad I never saw a grand. I got to stop a couple of them.
of them, which was a, a great feeling. Um, and I had a lot of interesting discussions with the, the people on the Faroe Islands, um, including uh, somebody that was actually a second mate on the Thunder when it was still a, a boat from up there. It was built originally for the Faroes, but it was an odd meeting of him on Pride Day of all the things in Torshavn Harbor. But uh, we had a little discussion about the Thunder. Um, but it, yeah, it's it's a it's a strange thing because the the, the difference in the, in their outlook is is completely you know I mean it's just it's like they've done it forever and they're going to continue doing it and maybe the next generation of them will stop doing it uh, I don't know but it's it's a uh, it's a pretty harsh reality to to go see uh, someone that uh, you know believes that a whale is a is a sentient being and and has a right to life and freedom in the seas. To, to watch that all go on is, is pretty hard. It's like, it is, it's hard to go see, uh, you know, animals get hunted in any way. Um, so yeah, and it's, it's a difficult, difficult campaign to continue on. Um, you know, we all got uh, kicked right out of that country last time. Uh, it's close as I ever got to being arrested was there. Um, and you know, you have to be based in the country to do anything about it because there's, there's no, uh, no international waters like there is in Antarctica. So it's, it's a really tricky, tricky campaign. Does anybody else have any questions? Because I'm just monopolizing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, team. Um, hey, Hans. Wish you were here, sweetie. Oh, is um, it? It's me. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm tired. Um, just a question, because uh, we've touched on fish farms and, and what an ecological disaster they are because they're clearing the seas for the feed to feed the farmed fish. We've got a situation in Lutruita in Tasmania where JBS has just acquired Huon Aquaculture. And Huon Aquaculture are one of the biggest players in fish farming in uh, Australia. And it's a $500 million acquisition. It's been ticked off by the, um, the Foreign Investment Review Board. So it's all going ahead and we know how bad JBS are for environmental reasons, for human rights reasons, for for animal rights reasons, how the hell do we come up against them? Like, how do we fight them when they're acquiring businesses like Huon Aquaculture? Huon Aquaculture have the big green tick from the government. They'll give them anything they want, any waterway they want. How do we fight them? And what's your advice to, to activists on how to combat this? I don't think this is a... Um an activist action the only way to fight these big massive companies like this is uh supply and demand if we don't want it they can't they they have no need to get it so the only way and the best way that we can fight these sort of um actions and this is a total way that anyone on the planet can do without being arrested or you know doing what we do or anything like Where's that the fun in that yeah oh, yeah it's true <laughs> <laughs> um but it's supply and demand. Stop buying it. Literally, you could be and you could be a normal day-to-day -day person who's not an activist, who's just out shopping. Just don't buy the product. Don't buy the product. You look for alternatives. Look for different other stuff. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of alternatives out there now. Veganism is so easy to do, or plant-based meals, anything like that. Just look for something else and don't buy the product. Do the research on the companies that you're buying from. I, I do. When I, when I was transitioning, you know, 11 years ago, I did a lot of research into the things I was buying. And I actually took the time to read the back of the packet, you know, because I wanted to know. And I was shocked at the things I've been eating for years and years and had no idea because I just took their word for it. You've got to stop taking their word for it. Do your own research and stop buying the products. That's the only way I can see that we would ever win against these companies. Anyone else? It's, it's a little bit of a, a different story uh, in here in Canada, particularly BC, because British Columbia is an unceded territory that was never signed over during the days that Canada was being founded. So there's uh, a lot more of a legal uh, legal weight for First Nations to to um, enforce their traditional territories um, upon these industries. And we've had some really great victories here now with um, at least 10 of these fish farms being moved out of key migration paths. Uh, that are in traditional territories, and this is an ongoing domino effect. And we've even had the uh, the Liberal government, federal Liberals, now are saying by 2025, all these fish farms need to be land-based 
and moved out of out of the, the waters. And we got over 200 of them. So, I mean, it's slowly happening. I mean, there's obviously the pushback from the industry because it costs a lot of money to build filtration systems to to run these farms on land. And they're not going to make the profits that they have by just putting their nets in the water with a million fish in each farm with all the disease going into the to the wild, you know. So it's it's there's some good victories. It's taken a long time. I think 1986 was when fish farms were first introduced into Canada off the east coast and the west coast. So it's taken over 30 years to to um, have any kind of victory against these guys. And, and it's been predominantly First Nations that have this victory because they're being more and more recognized now that this is their <laughs> this is their land. You know, it's stolen land and it's stolen water. And they've been walked over for far too long and now they're having some victories, which is great. You know, it's good for everybody. It's good for the ecosystem here. And it's good, for, you know, tourism is a big part of British Columbia. You're going to lose hundreds of thousands of jobs, over a few thousand jobs with fish farms if the wild salmon go extinct because everything on this coast relies on wild salmon to survive the, the circle of life here relies on salmon. So it's it's a it's a no-brainer. It's all it's gotta go on land. If they want to continue this, yeah, it's it's gotta go on land. So as long as you know 2025 when it comes around, if that happens, that's great. What do you what about you guys? Well, I, I think, you know, what you said about, about learning on your own uh, is important, but I think you got to share that, you know, you got to let people know why you don't eat fish. Mm. And uh, I never pass up an opportunity to educate somebody about uh, why I don't eat fish, you know, and because I think as Chad knows, when, once you've set foot on one of those boats, you're like, yeah, I'm not eating this <laughs> ever again, no matter what. And you know, that's one reason the, the sanitary conditions and then the environmental destruction and the animal rights. I mean, it just goes on and on. Um, so I think, you know, you, you work on your friends, you, uh, you know, you spread the word, you movies like conspiracy, uh, you know, come out and, uh, it, the movement's growing every day. And I think that's one of the things that, uh, is can make you get a little depressed when you're around activists all the time, always fighting, 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 and never really looking at, uh, how far ahead we've come, you know, and I know it's a slow process, but the difference between when I was a vegetarian 30 years ago and being a vegan now, it's night and day. Like the amount of people you go, the places you, you know, you don't have to explain anymore. You say, I, yeah. I want vegan food on the airplane. They're not like, what is that? You know, yeah. <laughs> so things are changing, you know, maybe not as rapidly as we all would hope, but I think that's the, the, the key is to keep spreading the word, you know, keep letting other people know why you don't eat fish, and you know, there's so many reasons you can pick one for each person, you know, find something that personally connects with them. Um, take them to see conspiracies, you know, show them all, all these documentaries that are out there about uh, about illegal fishing and legal fishing and how the rest of it. And ask them, you know, where where do you think your fish comes from? Mm -hmm. You know, make yeah. them think about a little bit where where the supply chain is. You know, it, it's you're eating fish, you know, out of Africa that is probably caught by illegal boats and definitely has you know killed whales and turtles and dolphins and all the rest of these things is it really worth it to you you know and that's what i'd say is just spread the word as much as possible you know and and the more people that are against it the the more the less likely this is going to continue on you know it's uh it's just one of those things it's, it's hard for sure because it's money you know money is hard to fight just because we only have a couple of minutes left, I think a really good question to end on would be for each of you, um, besides uh, cutting out fish from your diet completely, what would you say um, was a good piece of advice for an everyday person who's wanting to save the oceans? Good piece of advice. There's so much, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you we don't have much time, right? Um. Yeah, you know. Beach queens are obviously the big one to help the environment. Um, you know, reducing plastic in every every way possible. Um, you know, it's it's pretty much impossible, but you know, if you can start using, you know, brands that are using paper versus plastic, that's huge. Um, uh, there's, to be honest, with you, there's so many. Like, I, 
I, I do have, I, I, to add to that, Chad, um, one thing I have noticed when I do my shopping, I still take my little mesh bags when I get on my veggies and mm. stuff like that. And I use the paper, mushroom paper bags to get stuff if I've forgotten my, my mesh bags. But I've noticed that people, it, it, when they first came out, it was a big thing and everyone had their own mesh bags. Now people are just lazy. They're not doing it anymore. And mm. I feel like I'm the only person walking around the supermarket now with my little mesh bags getting on my veggies. And I don't care. I'm still going to do it. But I, I just feel like don't get complacent, don't get lazy, like continue that on, you know. You, you, it's never going to make, we're never going to make change by just being, it, it's a fad. We're going to do this for the next 10 minutes and then we're going to stop because <laughs> we can't be bothered. You know what I mean? You've got to keep doing it. Keep And, and it's not a, a hard effort to do. We've all gotten used to now taking our own, super, our own shopping bags into the supermarket. Mm. Leave your little mesh bags inside the, the shopping bags, you know, like it's just, it's just, to me, I'm seeing a lot of laziness going on and people say that they, they're environmental and they separate their rubbish and all that sort of stuff. But you can see when they go to the supermarket, they just don't care. It's like anything that's in the plastic that you can. Anyway, that's my two cents. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the same for me. I, even on the vessels here when we're doing the eco tours and I try and instill a little bit of education, the one thing that we're talking about now here is try not to use plastic um spend longer in the supermarket look at the ingredients and decide if it's uh good for you good for the environment again have a moral conscience and put it back on the shelf um we yeah reusable bags it's really simple stuff but it's conditioning and it's it's one of those things you know if, if the governments of the world can force us all to wear face masks for covid you know that's conditioning and uh, people don't complain about it now they do it just naturally you know, we can we can condition ourselves to be mm. better for the environment and, uh, you know, do these basic things at the supermarket. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I'd say, you know, along with only your own personal virtue, you know, to support organizations that are out there doing good things in the world and to, you know, spread the word, write letters to the editor, you know, go talk to your local news station, talk to your school newspapers, whatever it is, you know. If you get a chance, uh, one of my favorite things always is to go talk to kids, you know, when they're mm -hmm. in grade school or high school or somewhere like that, where they're still impressionable and you go out and tell them these things because we're all going to grow old and die. You know, we got to get yeah. them on board with, with doing these things. So the more people you talk to, the more people you explain why you're doing this to, and the more you just share uh, this attitude about taking care of the oceans, uh, you know, is, is going to be the best thing. I think some people get into their own little thing and they don't want to talk to anybody about it. And, you know, I understand some people don't like to talk. I like to talk. So, but uh, you, you, get to, you can always chat people up and, you know, explain why you got these mesh bags. Why aren't you buying fish? Why, you know, did you do this, that, and the other thing? And, and uh, letters to the editor are a great thing. I mean, I don't know. It's still, it's not quite like Twitter and all the rest of it, but you can continue to do that too. And, you know, share stories and, and get outside of your own little group of friends that already know all these things and, and mm. kind of spread the word out into uh, people that are not so aware of what's going on in the world. Yeah. Wonderful. I think we might end on that note. Um, we do, as uh, Chad mentioned, uh, Adelaide have a beach clean on the 13th of November at Henley Beach for anyone that's interested. So a little plug there. But a huge thank you for these guys for joining us today um, across different time zones. Um, please give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thank you so much. See y'all. Take care.